What is your concern with me? Schmendrick the magician cleared his throat and bowed to the pale-eyed old man. We seek to enter your service. Far and wide has the fabled court of King Haggard... I need no servants. The king turned away, his face and body suddenly slack with indifference. Yet Smendrick sensed a curiosity lingering in the stone-colored skin and at the roots of the gray hair. He said cautiously, But surely you keep some sweet, some following. Simplicity is the richest adornment of a king, I grant you. But for such a king as Haggard, you are losing my interest. The rustling voice interrupted him again, And that is very dangerous. In a moment I will have forgotten you quite entirely, and you never will be able to remember just what I did with you. What I forget not only ceases to exist, but never really existed in the first place. As he said this, his eyes, like those of his son, turned to meet the Lady Amalthea's eyes. My court, he continued, since you choose to call it that, consists of four men-at-arms. I would do without them if I could, for they cost more than they are worth, like everything else. But they take their turns as sentries and as cooks, and they give up the appearance of an army from a distance. What other attendants should I need? But the pleasures of the court, the magician cried, the music, the talk, the women and the fountains, the hunts and the masks and the great feasts. They are nothing to me, King Haggard said. I have known them all, and they have not made me happy. I will keep nothing near me that does not make me happy. The Lady Amalthea moved quietly past him to the window and looked out at the night sea. Schmendrick came about to catch the wind again and declared, I understand you perfectly. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to you all the uses of this world. You are bored with bliss, satiated with sensation, jaded with jejun joys. It is a king's affliction, and therefore no one wants the services of a magician more than a king does. For only to a magician is the world forever fluid, infinitely mutable, and eternally new. Only he knows the secret of change. Only he knows truly that all things are crouched in eagerness to become something else. And it is from this universal tension that he draws his power. To magician, march is may, snow is green, and grass is gray. This is that, or whatever you say. Get a magician today. He finished on one knee with both arms flung wide. King Haggard stepped nervously away from him, muttering, Get up, get up, you make my head hurt. Besides, I already have a royal magician. Schmendrick rose heavily to his feet, his face red and empty. You never said. What is his name? He is called Mabrook, King Haggard replied. I do not often speak of him. Even my men-at-arms do not know that he lives here in the castle. Mabrook is all that you have said a wizard should be, and much more that I doubt you dream of. He is known in his trade as the magician's magician. I can see no reason to replace him with some vagrant, nameless, clownish... Oh, but I can. Schmendrick broke in desperately. I can think of one reason, uttered by yourself not a minute since. This marvelous Mabrook does not make you happy. Over the king's fierce face, there fell a slow shadow of disappointment and betrayal. For a breath, he looked like a bewildered young man. Why, no, that is true, King Haggard murmured. Mabrook's magic has not delighted me for a long time. How long has it been, I wonder? He clapped his hands briskly, crying out, Mabrook! Mabrook! Appear, Mabrook! I am here, said a deep voice from a far corner of the room. An old man in a dark spangled gown and a pointed spangled hat was standing there, and no one could say surely that he had not been standing there in plain sight since they entered the throne room. His beard and brows were white, and the cast of his face was mild and wise, but his eyes were as hard as hailstones. What does your majesty wish of me? Mabrook. King Haggard said, This gentleman is of your fraternity. His name is Schmendrick. The old wizard's icy eyes widened slightly, and he peered at the shabby man. Why, so it is! He exclaimed in seeming pleasure. Schmendrick, my dear boy, how nice to see you. You won't remember me, but I was a dear, dear friend of your tutor, dear old Nikos. He had such high hopes for you, the poor man. 
Well, well, this is a surprise. And are you really still in the profession? My, you're a determined fellow. I always say perseverance is nine-tenths of any art. Not that it is much help to be nine-tenths of an artist, of course. But what can it be that brings you here? He has come to take your place. King Haggard's voice was flat and final. He is now my royal magician. Schmendrick's start of amazement was not lost on Old Mabrook, though the wizard himself seemed little surprised by the king's decision. For a moment, he obviously considered the worth of wrath, but instead he chose a tone of genial amusement. As your majesty wills it, now and always, he purred. But perhaps your majesty might be interested in learning a bit of history of this new magician. I am sure dear Schmendrick won't mind my mentioning that he is already something of a legend in the trade. Indeed, among adepts, he is best remembered as Nikos's folly. His charming and completely inability to master the simplest rune, his creative way with the most childish rhyme at theurgy, let alone... King Haggard made a thin motion with the edge of one hand, and Mabrook was suddenly silent. Prince Lear giggled. The king said, I do not need to be persuaded of his unfitness for the position. A single glance at him tells me that, as a glance makes it plain, that you are the one of the greatest wizards of the world. Mabrook swelled gently, fondling his glorious beard and wrinkling his benign brow. But that is also nothing new to me. King Haggard went on. In the past you have performed whatever miracle I required of you, and all of it has done been and all of it has done has been to spoil my taste for miracles. No task is too vast for your powers, and yet the wonder is achieved. Nothing has changed. It must be that great power cannot give me whatever it is that I really want. A master magician has not made me happy. So I will see what an incompetent one will do. You may go, Mabrook. He nodded his head to dismiss the old wizard. Mabrook's semblance of affability vanished like a spark on snow and with the same sound. His whole face became like his eyes. I am not packed off as easily as that, he said very softly. Not on a whim, even a king's whim, and not in favor of a fool. Beware, Haggard. Mabrook is no one to anger lightly. A wind began to rise in the dark chamber. It came as much from one place as another, though the window, through the window, through the half-open door, but its true source was the clenched figure of the wizard. The wind was cold and rank, a wet, hoodie marsh wind, and it leapt here and there in the room, like a gleeful animal discovering the flimsiness of human beings. Molly Grew shrank against Smendrick, who looked uncomfortable. Prince Lear fidgeted his sword in and out of its sheath. Even King Haggard gave back a step before the triumphant grin of old Mabrook. The walls of the room seemed to thaw and run away, and the wizard's starry gown became the huge howling night. Mabrook spoke no word himself, but the wind was beginning to make a wicked grunting sound as it gained strength. In another moment it would become visible, burst into shape. Schmendrick opened his mouth, but if he were shouting a counterspell, it could not be heard, and it did not work. 